Today we're learning Parshat Vayeshev. And uh, we are on page 199 of the Art Scroll Chumash. Last week we learned about Yaakov meeting Esav and having uh, difficulty with his daughter Dina. And after suffering so much with uh, Lavan and with uh, Esav and with Dina, finally Yaakov comes home. Finally, Yaakov meets with his father. He no longer has a mother. His mother Rivka passed away when uh, he was still on the way and uh, he doesn't have his uh, beloved wife Rachel anymore but he still has three wives 12 boys and one girl and at this point Yaakov is 108 years old Yitzchak is 168 years old and uh, since we know Yitzchak passed away when he was 180 that means Yitzchak is still alive for 12 more years and even though last week's Parsha we learned that Yitzchak died at the age 180 uh, the Torah mentioned his death because he no longer plays a role in the uh, the narrative of the Torah um, and that's the the way of the Torah once we don't need the person anymore for the events that are coming up the Torah just mentions and by the way sometime later this person um, leaves the world uh, Yosef at this point is 17 years old and we start Yaakov settled in the land of his father's dwelling in the land of Canaan and seemingly things should be good now he is back with his father reunited all his children are born and are with him Esav is out of the picture Lavan is out of the picture the trouble with Dina was resolved Dina is back with the family so it seems that uh, the last years of Yaakov's life should be bright and clear unfortunately this is not to be and the second pasuk says these are the chronicles of Yaakov this is what caused Yaakov the next trouble and that is Yosef at the age of 17 years he was a shepherd with his brothers he was 17 he was the youngest among the brothers because Binyamin who was eight years younger Binyamin was only eight or nine years old didn't work with brothers yet Binyamin was with his father and uh, out of the 11 brothers that were shepherding uh, Yosef was the youngest and the Torah tells us at the end of verse uh, 2 and Yosef would bring evil reports about them to their father being the youngest he was the least useful and he was used as a messenger so his father would send him to the brothers with some provisions and uh, he would visit his brothers help them out spend some time and then go back to the father and tell him how his uh, children are doing but unfortunately Yosef took upon himself also the job of what's called a mashgiach mashgiach means the overseer the one who looks at the situation and reports to the Rosh Yeshiva to the head of the academy 
and Mashgiach uh, is supposed to be attentive to all details and mistakes and he's supposed to rebuke people and if it doesn't help he has to report to the Rosh Yeshiva and here's where Yosef made a mistake being that he was the youngest it was not his role to be the Mashgiach to be the one to rebuke the brothers and he got into trouble because of it because when someone younger than you is rebuking you you don't take him seriously and if he continues at it then you find him annoying and that's what um, happened with the brothers they felt like often happens that the younger child tries to get the older child into trouble with the parents because the younger child cannot compete with the older child so he tries to make the older child look bad in the eyes of the parents so that's what the brothers thought Yosef was trying to do and on top of it verse 3 comes and adds another piece to the puzzle now Yisrael Yaakov loved Yosef more than all his sons since he was a child of his old age meaning since he waited for Yosef for so many years first he worked for seven years to be able to get to marry Rachel and to have children from her and then when he got married to her he had to wait for another six years until Rachel became pregnant and Rachel gave birth to Yosef at the end of the second seven years so he had to wait for Yosef for 14 years and he was the first son of his beloved wife and she wasn't alive anymore so he loved Yosef naturally however it was uh, not a smart idea to show that love in front of the brothers we understand he waited for so long and he misses his wife and Yosef reminds him of her and being that he is uh, so young Yaakov feels that Yosef needs help but it creates a, a negative feeling among uh, the brothers because they feel that the father doesn't like them for some reason and on top of that Totoro says and he made him a fine woolen tunic a coat of fine wool only for him not for the brothers so the commentators say that this was uh, a special garment a precious garment that Esav stole from um, Nimrod and he deposited it with his mother Rivka and uh, that was the garment that Rivka put on on Yaakov when Yaakov went uh, to get the blessing from his father Yitzhak and that's why his father didn't recognize him because Yaakov was wearing Esav's robe and later this uh, coat became Yaakov's possession and now Yaakov is giving it to Yosef and this was a special coat whoever possessed it first of all it was beautiful but also it has special powers that while you wear it you can control animals and we're on page 201 his brother saw that it was he whom their father loved most of all his brothers so they hated him and they could not speak to him peacefully not only the father is showing apparent favoritism but the uh, the subject of the favoritism is placing himself higher than the brothers and he is trying to destroy the brother's image in the father's eyes what was Yosef saying exactly so Yosef really was innocent Re Yosef was really a an immature um, youth he didn't realize the impact that his actions will have 
as our sages say, Ezu Chacham Haroet Hanolad. Who is a wise man? The one that foresees the future. The one who looks a few steps ahead. What will his actions cause? And Yosef failed to recognize what's going to happen if he complains about the brothers to the father. It could be that he held them in such a great esteem. He thought there was such tzaddikim that they will easily understand that he means good and that the only reason why he complains to the father is because he wants to make them even more perfect. He thought they'll appreciate it. He saw that they were doing certain questionable things and uh, the second mistake he made was that he didn't discuss it with them. Instead of approaching them and telling them, my dear brothers, I noticed that you do such and such. Can you please explain your behavior? And they would explain to him that only on the outside it seems bad, but really what happened was different. And uh, it, it, instead of doing that, he went to his father, Yaakov, and he complained. From here we see how dangerous Lashon Hara is. How dangerous it is to speak to someone about the person without speaking to the person first. Which means, if someone hurts you, don't go and complain about it to someone else. First, approach the person who hurt you and tell him, my dear friend, I got hurt from such and such event. Did you mean to do it? Did you know that I'm going to be hurt? This way you are opening the door for the other person to apologize or to explain his actions. He might say, oh, I'm so happy that you're telling me this. I didn't realize. I didn't want to hurt you. I didn't expect that it's going to lead to that. Please forgive me. Or he might say, Oh, that's what you thought I was doing? No, I was doing completely something different. You misunderstood me. You misunderstood my words and you misunderstood my actions. So you got hurt because of your misunderstanding, but I didn't mean it and I didn't do it. So by approaching the person and explaining to him that you got hurt and asking him if that's what he meant to do, you're giving him opportunity to reconcile, to explain himself and potentially to ask for forgiveness. But imagine if instead of that, you go and you complain and the person really was innocent. He didn't mean to hurt you. And now he hears that you complained. He's going to be hurt. Now you are hurting him instead of him hurting you. And then he's going to be upset at you. And if he's not a person of high moral caliber, he might go and um, fight with you or might go and complain against you. So uh, you're putting yourself at the risk by complaining instead of facing the person and speaking about it. So that's what happened with Yosef. If he would have spoken with his brothers, they would tell him what you saw is not what really happened. You assumed the background and you assumed our intent, but that wasn't so. Instead, Yosef went and innocently told his father and the brothers had a reason to believe that Yosef had had evil intent in mind. Because they see Yaakov loves Yosef, so they think Yosef is thinking too highly of himself and they suspect that perhaps Yosef is dreaming of becoming the leader of the family. And unfortunately that is the case sometimes with the younger or weaker person it, it, to offset his weakness or his uh, young age he tries to show himself as bold courageous as strong and uh, sometimes 
he steps on the older people's toes. And therefore, uh, that's what they suspected Yosef was doing, while Yosef wasn't. So really, Yosef suspected them, and they suspected him. Uh, but in reality, he didn't mean anything bad. He was trying to help them. And they didn't do anything bad. Yosef suspected them for nothing. So this is a classical case of miscommunication. Very often, two people get into a fight because they misunderstand each other. He thinks she did this, and she thinks he did that. He thinks she thinks like this about him, and she thinks he thinks like that about her. And they're both mistaken, and they're both suffering, and they're both fighting for nothing, for their mistaken view. If only they would know how to approach each other and to communicate, and to open up and to resolve their questions, their suspicions, they would live peacefully ever after. So, we learn a lot from the interaction of uh, brothers with Yosef. And these are the first of the many lessons. Now, verse 5 on page 201. Yosef dreamt a dream which he told his brothers. This was his further mistake. And they hated him even more. What was such a dream that uh, made the brothers so angry? He said to them, this is the dream which I dreamt. We were binding sheaves, bundles of, of wheat in the field, and my sheaf arose, and your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. Sounds like a very haughty statement. Anyone who would say that to us, we would think that he has a, a wild imagination and he is trying to hurt us. He's making it up and he's trying to convince us that he's better than us. In reality, Yosef actually saw this dream. They thought he was uh, making it up. And even if he really see, did see this dream, they thought must be it's a sign that he's thinking about ruling over them the, the whole day. Because we have a, 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 a rule about dreams that whatever person thinks about during the day, that's what he sees in his sleep. Because his mind is still active and uh, the images that he saw or thoughts that he thought of during the day pop up in his mind while he's sleeping. So, if he's thinking about ruling over them at night, must be that's what his mind is occupied with during the day. So, they hated him. The, his brother said, would you then dominate us? And they hated him because of his dream and because of his talk. And as if this wasn't enough, he dreamt another dream. And again, he didn't think of the consequence. He shared the dream with his brothers. We see that really he was innocent and immature. And he, he wasn't thinking what his words were doing to the brothers. He did it just because of his uh, innocence. And he said, look, I dreamt another dream dream the sun the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me not anymore it was the sheaves were bowing, bowing down to other sheaves someone was actually bowing to me now the brothers are thinking he is more self-centered and who are the stars 11 stars, the brothers. Who is the sun and the moon? Their father and their mother. 
which mother? Yosef's mother is not alive. That means the brother said, the brothers said, it's our mother, Mother Leah, is going to bow down to Yosef? That was too much for them. Our father, Yaakov, is going to bow down to Yosef? Not only he's going against us, he's even going against our mother and our father. We must stop this behavior. And he related to his father and to his brother. His father, Yaakov, being a smart man, he scolded him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamt? Will I and your mother come and your brothers and bow down to you to the ground? So his father was smart and instead of pointing out that it means Leah, he said it means your mother. But your mother is not alive anymore. And therefore the dream is not true. And since part of the dream is not true, the entire dream is not true. And therefore he said to Yosef, Yosef, don't talk, think about it and don't talk about it. It's not true. Really, he said it in order to calm his children down. Really, he suspected that that may be true because he himself had to go through it. He was the youngest child and the prophecy came that he will rule over the older child. And he knows that his father, Yitzhak, was the younger child and he was uh, chosen as the leader of the family over Ishmael. So he's already expecting it and he says that's very likely that you Yosef, one of the youngest children, will be the leader. But in order not to make the brothers uh, upset, he said don't worry it's not true. So his brothers still were jealous of him but his father kept the matter in mind, meaning he understood the message and he was waiting. When will this dream come true? Now we'll go to page 203. Brothers went to pasture their father's flock in Shechem. And Yisrael, another name for Yaakov, said to Yosef, Come, I will send you to them. Go now, look into their welfare and bring me back a word and uh, first he went to the original location they were not there and uh, a man saw him and guided him to where they are in a place called Dotan and now we're on in, in verse 18 they saw him from afar and when he had not yet approached them they conspired against him to kill him. And they said, verse 20, Now let us come and kill him and throw him into one of the pits while he is dead. And we will say to our father, A wild beast devoured him. And then we shall see what will become with his dreams. Yosef, not Yosef, Ruven, Yosef's oldest brother, came to his help. Yosef was 17, Ruven, the oldest, was 23. And Ruven heard and he rescued him from their hand. He said, we will not strike him mortally. Now we go to page 205. Shed no blood, throw him instead into this pit, alive. But lay no hand on him, intending to rescue him from their hand, to return him to his father. He pretended that he is really with them. He just doesn't want to kill him with their own hands. You can still kill him passively. Throw him into a pit from which he cannot climb out and leave. And he'll die in there. But at least you're not going to kill him. But his intent was to come back when they're not watching and to bring him back to his father. And so it was, verse 24, they took him and cast him into the pit. And the pit was empty. No water was in it. 
so he would soon die from thirst. But then, all of a sudden, they saw a caravan coming in the desert. In verse 26, Yehuda said to his brothers, What gain will we have if he dies? Let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. And uh, he's going to be taken to a faraway land, sold into slavery, and we're not going to hear from him again. But at least we're not going to kill him. His brothers agreed. So, Yosef was sold to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And Yosef was brought to Egypt. In the Midrash, it tells us a long story of what happened on the way, the, the, the harsh uh, trip that Yosef had to go through, where they tortured him, they beat him up, and uh, he, he changed hands, they sold him time and again, until finally he was sold um, to an Egyptian. Now, verse 29, Reuven returned to the pit, and Yosef was not there, so he tore his garments. Now, page 207, verse 31, they took Yosef's coat, slaughtered a baby goat and dipped the coat in the blood and they brought the coat to the father and they said is it your son's coat or not he recognized it and he said yes it's my son's coat a savage beast devoured him yosef has surely been torn to bits Yaakov tore his garments and placed sackcloth on his body and he mourned for his son for many days and he refused to be comforted. Now verse 36, the Medanites whom, to whom the Ishmaelites sold Yosef to had sold him to Egypt to Potiphar, the minister of Paro, who was in charge of butchers. Some say that means he was in charge of animals that were served for food. But some point out that Egyptians didn't eat animals. And therefore here the word butcher means that he was chief executioner. And that explains why later when he suspected Yosef of uh, an affair with his wife, he threw him into the, the prison that he was in charge of. The criminals would be placed there and those that uh, deserve death penalty, he would, would uh, administer it. Now, we go to page 209. We go to Yehuda. Yehuda is 21 years old at this point. And uh, Yehuda gets married. He get, got married to daughter of Shua, man Shua. Her, his daughter, we, we don't know her name. She gave birth to three sons. The first one was Er. The second one was Onan. And the third one was Shelah. Now, verse 6, Yehuda took a wife for Er, his firstborn, which means a few years passed already since they sold Yosef. Yehuda got married. He had a child. The child grew up and the child got married as well. So the Torah in a few sentences is telling us a span of many years. Her name was Tamar. Er's wife is Tamar. And uh, Midrash says that Tamar is daughter of Shem, the 